Comedy Central. Come on, stand up with us. Let's sing. Every soul. Every soul and every beating heart. Every nation and every tongue. Come find hope in the love of the Father. That's why we're here. All creation. All creation will bow as one. Lift the rise to the risen sun. Jesus, save your forever and after. This is love. This is love. Jesus came to die again. Sing, I got, I got his love. Ooh, yeah, I got his love. Every distance, every distant broken heart, every prayer, every outstretched arm. Hope in the love of the fire. It's you ways, let us praise his rise. All the glory for all of time. Jesus, save your forever and
78 degrees the whole time, no humidity, and I heard it rained here the entire time, and I'm not sorry, because it was good to get away, I'm not going to lie. So me and my wife and our two kids, it was so great, they even did good on our plane ride, we get back into Texas, we get almost to the loop, and our car breaks down. <laughs> so it was great, but I knew the Lord, he blessed us with this great week, and he figured out a way to get our car off the road, and it worked out, and I just knew, in the good and bad, we would bless the Lord. At all times, and no matter what. And I knew that God was in both the situations to take care of us and loving us. So we have a reason, no matter what's happened to you, to come in here and sing to Jesus Christ. Whether your heart is hurting or you are filled with joy, we all here for one purpose, to bless the name of Jesus. That's a great time to worship with you all. I want to welcome all of our first and second time guests this morning. In the seat in front of you, there is a guest information card. Take a few seconds for us, fill it out. If you will hold on to it to the very end of the service, you can take it back to our welcome booth in our foyer, and we're going to have a little gift for you guys. So go around, everyone. Find someone new. Find some familiar faces. Shake some hands. Welcome. Welcome. It's exciting to get to see everybody, isn't it? Coming out of the rain. Yeah, all right. Come on. Let's sing this song. Let's just sing this song. Yeah, let's sing this song. We're glad he's here to say we love him and Ashley. We're glad you came to church with us this morning. We love our church. We love worshiping together. I like that. I like that song. I love the song when the drummer gets crazy back there. I like that. That's why he's in a box. If you can see what he's doing, it would be good. But, but just listen to it. Incredible. Great job. Okay. All right. Um, there are many things that make up a, a great service. One of them, of course, is the, our prayer time, our worship time, and singing. But we also worship and do giving. And we have a giving opportunity for you. You know, uh, our young people, I'm going to tell you about something tonight that's happening. We're, we're sending a large group of young people to Nicaragua. Uh, they're going this summer. I'm telling you, there's nothing that will change your life more than a trip to a mission field. And 
and see what God is doing with people in different cultures and different places and different languages. And we have a group that are going, and they're paying their way. They're, they're coming up with their own money. But then just to help them out, we're going to have a cake auction tonight. And they'll talk to you more about this in a little bit. But I just want to push it for you and say that if you cannot come, now they're going to feed us free, I think, because spaghetti and meatballs. Is that right? Yeah. Somebody said, was it tofu meatballs? I don't know. No. It's cow meatballs. We don't have cows. Uh, spaghetti and meatballs. But... They're feeding that free, but then we're going to have cakes and pies and we're going to auction them off. And we want to raise a lot of money to help make it possible this life changing event as young people. Now, if you can't come, first of all, you should come. You don't want to miss that 6 o'clock night, but if you can come, there's somebody you can't come. Uh, please leave some money for it. Uh, there is a, put it in an offering envelope in front of you. You can make it a write it out cake auction and just put some money in it. Write the check to Central Baptist Church. If you want to raise a lot of money, or if you want to give it uh, to uh, one of my, I say give it to me, but I don't like to handle the money. But if you want to give it to Joel, Joel can handle it. He'll, we'll see that it gets better on the cake, and we'll get it done. So thank you for that. But, of course, regular tithes and offerings make possible these ministries without which we could do what we do. So we're going to ask our ushers to take their place and you join in the giving today. May the Lord bless you in this giving opportunity. Father, we enjoy being together. Lord, and how wonderful it is to not have to go to church out of duty, but to go to church out of pure joy, to be in the presence of you and your angels, but also in the presence of God's people, our family. Thank you for all that are here, those that we've known for years and those that's their first time. And may everyone hear from you today, every single one of us hear from you, and may you change our lives through the power of the Spirit and the Word of God. Bless this giving opportunity. May every need be met as we will respond to generosity. In Jesus' name, we ask it. Amen. God bless you. sing along.
turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning. The cross, the cross before. Here's my life, Lord. It's all for you. 
just feel somebody's here today that's going through a struggle. Maybe you haven't been in church much. Maybe this is your first time. But I'm here to tell you that we serve a God that has a blood that can wash away all sin. And you're sitting there saying, well, it's a, it's a bad sin. There's just no way. Any sin. We've all sinned. We all have bad days, trust me. I'm here to tell you that that blood, it can wash you white as snow. God worthy of praise. It's a God worthy.
Wonderful worship today. I enjoyed that so much. We are blessed to get to enjoy what we enjoy, aren't we? In Mark chapter 5, I want to read some verses with you in a little bit. Mark chapter 5. But get your mind set. I want to talk about helping those who are out of control. Think of the hell of the obsessive. Have you ever been out of control? Have you ever done things that you swore you never would? Have you created destructive relationships knowing that they are bad for you? Have you found yourself literally enslaved to forces that make your self-esteem plummet and alienate you from people you respect and admire? Have you kept a secret life going because you couldn't leave behind needs and desires that didn't fit with your public life? Have you ever despaired because you had a habit or a need that was endangering your life and relationships, but that you felt you were powerless to stop or even limit in your life? That's the hell of the obsessive. The limited vocabulary of those who are out of control are words like addiction, codependence, obsessions, compulsions, needs. And the operative word to that sentence is limited. Limited. Obsessive behavior, out of control people are limited. We may underestimate the value of being able to control our lives on a personal level. To be able to decide whether or not you want to be in a relationship or spend money on something or even have a physical experience may be one of life's greatest treasures. You decide you're not forced and controlled and compelled. That may be one of our greatest treasures. No one knows this better than the uncontrolled, those whose lives seem to be spinning out of control. But there are many like that in our society, and there are perhaps some of you like that on some range of that scale today. In Mark chapter 5, we see the story of just such a man. So as you're in your Bible, let's read some verses together and see how Christ confronts and heals an out-of-control man. In verse number 1 of chapter 5 of Mark, it says, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. Now, that means they basically just crossed over the Sea of Galilee from the area of modern-day Jordan to where Gatherings is. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God 
that you do not torment me. Let's talk about how Jesus controls the uncontrollable. Notice about where this uncontrollable man lived. He lived in the tombs, according to verse number 2. Literally in the graveyard. His life was so out of control, that was the only place he could stay. It had driven him away. His demons had driven him away from family, career, everything that he loved. And he was reduced to living in a tomb. Now, tombs in those days were basically, they would carve out a cave out of the side of a mountain and roll a stone in front of it, as you're familiar with the story of Jesus. And so he was living in one of the... Now, can you imagine what that smelt like? Can you imagine what it was like to live among the dead and to live among the decay? But that's what it had happened to him. Secondly, how did he live? He was living in an insane life. Literally insane. He was out of control. The Scripture says he couldn't even be changed. They would take him and, and, and do the best that society could offer him. They would try to control him by chaining him down putting shackles on him, putting shackles on his wrists and chains on him. But the Scripture says he had so much strength that he would break those shackles in pieces and they couldn't tame him. So he was out of control. He was without dignity. This same story is told in the Gospel of Luke. And in Luke 8, verse 27, we're told that he was naked. He wouldn't wear clothes. He didn't want, his demon not only was uh, desiring not only to force him into uh, living in, away from family and friends and in a terrible place, but he wanted to make a mockery of him and make an embarrassment of him and strip him of all dignity. And so he lived naked. And he was in pain. The Scripture says he was tormented, crying out night and day. This was not a happy existence. He was tormented, crying out. His, his heart was broken. He was miserable. And the last thing we see is that he was alone, completely alone. By himself. No one else with him. The communicator's commentary says, One of the most pitiful sights in the world is a person whose mind is so torn that he or she worships while cursing and confesses while blaspheming. If ever a picture of Satan's ultimate motive in possessing a person has been painted, this is it. The devil is never content until he has destroyed the last vestige of the image of God and the human personality. You know, Peter warned us that the devil walketh about like a lion seeking whom he may devour. And sometimes we forget that. We forget that our enemy, we have a spiritual enemy who doesn't want to just limit you in your life. He wants to turn you into this man of the tombs. He wants to strip you of dignity. He wants to make you miserable. He wants to fill your life with pain. And he wants to cause you to be so mixed up that you blaspheme and curse and you praise God all with the same voice. He wants to tear your life upside down. And that's what he had done to this man. He was out of control. Why was he living like he was? Verse 2 says it was because he had an unclean spirit. He had a spiritual demon that was controlling him. Now this is not a man that is at war with himself, but a man at war with other beings who have forced themselves into his life. You know, there's a lot of things we can figure out. Sometimes we are our own worst enemy and sometimes we can use counseling and psychology and psychiatry to help us figure out the quirks in our mental thinking to make us stronger. But there are some things that are not without us, or some things that are not within us, there are things that are without us that are controlling us. And in this man's case, it happened to be a demon. But for other people, it can be different things. In my life of ministry, I've met many people who have been controlled by different things, one of which is chemicals, whether it's the chemicals of drug or the chemical of alcohol, but it so takes over their life that as one friend said to me about this person who they were trying to deal with him, and he just kept tearing up his family, just kept losing his job, just kept getting in trouble with the law. And he had an alcohol problem. And somebody said, you know, when someone has an alcohol problem, you're not dealing with the person anymore. You're dealing with the drug. And that's true. You're not, you're not able to have a rational discussion because there's no rationality involved. If there is something without that is controlling. But in verses 8 through 14, let's read a little bit further. Jesus takes control of the out of control man. So... He says to him in verse 8, Jesus said, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And he said, What is your name? And he answered, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountain. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. 
And the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine, and there were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demonized or demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told him how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine, and they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him, and Jesus said, No, go home to your friends, go tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how He has had compassion on you. And then Jesus departed and began to proclaim, or that man departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for them and all marveled. So Jesus takes control. This is an incredible sight. I actually had the privilege of standing on this site on the edge of the shore of Galilee, and it is quite a, a steep cliff that leads down into the ocean. Can you imagine this herd of swine? You know, the, the demon is so many that his name is Legion. Uh, Legionnaires force of different size. Uh, they've argued about this through whether it was 900 people or 1,000 people in a unit or, or so many, but there were literally hundreds of these demons in this man. And so Jesus says, I'm going to cast you out. And they said, well, we don't want you to throw us so we want to go somewhere. Don't just send us out into the void. And there was a herd of swine. And they said, let us go into these pigs. And so he said, you've got to stop and think. Why? It's always interesting. What are these pigs doing there? This is a Jewish country and they're forbidden to eat pork. Right? And they got a herd of swine. And a herd of swine over there. What, what are they, just wild swine wandering around? We know we're not that because we find out later that somebody owns these swine. So these swine are not, so you say, why did Jesus, Jesus is kind of mean to these pigs in a way. Not really, I mean, they're not supposed to have those swine anyway. But I can just imagine, he casts the demons out, they go into the swine, and they stampede down into the water. Wouldn't that have been a sight? Have you ever seen a stampeding herd of pigs? I know it's kind of a funny sight, isn't it, to think about it. But it, they just come cascading down this, and it didn't last very long because they, they didn't want to be cast out, but the minute they cast in the swine, the swine didn't want them either. <laughs> This one, you know, they say that pigs are one of the smartest animals. I've got to give them a little credit here. They'd rather drown than be demon-possessed. So, hey, we ran down into the water and drowned themselves. But then the people that own the pig, very interesting thing. The people who own the pigs come out, and they find this man transformed, one of the greatest miracles of all time. You would think they'd want Jesus to stick around. Well, what do they do? They say, we want you to leave. Why do they want him to leave? He just cost them $2,000, 2,000 pigs. They didn't want him there. They didn't want him there because of what had happened. But nonetheless, the devils didn't want to leave the man they inhabited. They begged to stay. And the reality is Jesus took control and he cast the demons out. You know, there are people still like that today who are unwilling to let Christ into their life because they have a suspicion that if Christ comes in, a good deal will have to go. Some of you want Jesus in your life, but you only want so much of Jesus. I remember reading something by Reese Jones, Wilbur Rees, I should have brought it, but I've never gotten over it because he talks about he wants $5 worth of God, please. $5 worth of God. He said, not enough to make me love a a migrant or not enough to make me help somebody, not enough to change my life, but just $5 worth of God in a paper sack, please. I think a lot of people are like that in our church. They just want $5 worth of Jesus, please. I want enough Jesus so that I can sleep at night if the, something goes bump in the night and I cry out to Jesus. I want enough Jesus so that if the doctor says there's something wrong with me, then I'll be able to say, well, God is my Savior. But I don't want so much Jesus that He might change my schedule and have me going to church regularly or have me serving in the church or have me giving in the church. I don't want that much Jesus. This man had demons that had to go before He could be the man that he needed to be. Jesus took control and he cast the demons out. Verse verse 15 tells us that the uncontrollable was controlled. He is sitting there dressed and in his right mind. Sitting clothed and in his right mind. I don't know how long he had been possessed. I don't know how long he had lived in those tombs. I don't know how long he had been out of control. But for the first time in a very long time, he was able to sit down, put his clothes on, And just sit there and be at peace and listen to the Son of God preach. Mark 15, 5, 15, and the message is, They came to Jesus and saw the madman sitting there wearing decent clothes, making sense, no longer a walking madhouse of a man. 
no longer a walking madhouse of the man. And you know, that's what Jesus can do for people out of control. He can help them get under control so they're no longer by walking madhouses. Then verse 19, we find the ministry of those that Jesus has conquered. He says, the guy says, I want to go with you wherever you go. Jesus said, no, I got something more important for you to do. I want you to go tell the people where you grew up, the people of your hometown, what powerful things God has done for you. I want you to share your story. I want you to go tell them what Jesus has done for you. And he immediately got busy doing just exactly that. This series has been about telling your story. How would the demon-possessed man tell his story? I think it would go something like this. Before I met Jesus, I was out of control and my life was in ruins. The demons that inhabited me drove me away from my family, friends, and career. I was reduced to insane behavior. I lived in the most horrible places. I actually lived in graves, drug out of the side of a mountain. Nothing anyone could do would help me. They tried to chain me, but my demons were too strong. I seemed to possess supernatural strength while I used all my abilities to serve my demon. I was so miserable, I took to cutting myself so that I could control at least one area of my life, the only area left to me, my pain. My life was a living hell. And then I met Jesus. I heard of this preacher of hope and life called Jesus. And when I saw him arriving my boat near my graveyard home, I ran to him. I fought my demons with all my strength and I fell on my knees before him where I begged for his help. He forced the demons to identify themselves and then in a moment that I will never forget and will never get over, he forced them out of my life. I was immediately changed. And for the first time in a long time, I was in control of myself. What would he say about after Jesus? I was able to live, dress, and act like a normal person for the first time in years. I sat at Jesus' feet and listened to him preach. And when he said he was going to the next town, I begged to go with him. He refused to let me go, but he insisted instead that I go back to my hometown and tell everyone what he had done for me. And that's exactly what I did. And I continue to live a normal life full of the joys of controlled behavior. And every chance I get, I tell my story of how Jesus set me free. Controlling the uncontrollable. What to do if you're out of control? Some of you may be out of control here today or at a certain level. Or maybe you know someone that is out of control. First thing to do is realize that your choices control your life. Eleanor Roosevelt said, in the long run, we shape our lives and we shape ourselves. The process never ends until we die, and the choices we make ultimately are our responsibility. Eleanor Roosevelt. Well, we do make decisions. I don't know what choices the demonic person had made, but there is no doubt that he had made choices that opened him up to spiritual attack. Listen, we need to understand that every choice we make has a consequence. Every action has consequence. Every choice you make, what you choose to do with your time today will have a consequence. Particularly if you have homework that, do, that is due tomorrow. And if you don't study today or you don't do your homework today and you go to class tomorrow, it's going to have a consequence, right? Say amen, students. Say, say thank you, pastor, for that reminder. Listen, we, the actions have consequence. All, everything you and I do, when we make a decision, it has a consequence. Now, I don't know what decisions this man had made. I'm not putting all the blame on him because he had a powerful enemy, but he had some blame, and we need to understand that. What did he do or not do? I don't know, but let me guess at some things. Perhaps he had chose not to attend worship. You know, this is a good Jewish kid. Perhaps he didn't want to go to the synagogue. Perhaps he didn't want to go up to the temple and worship. Perhaps he was too busy to give God his Saturdays, which would have been for a Jew, instead of his Sundays. So I'm not going to worship. I'm not going to honor God. I haven't got time for God in my life. And do you know, that choice, that decision made him more vulnerable to demonic attack. Now, a lot of you think the only reason we want you here is so we can count your heads or so we can have so many people. But the reality is, there is you choosing to honor God with your life and worship on a Sunday is a choice that strengthens your life and protects you from satanic attack. And when you choose not to do so, when you choose to take the Lord's day and make it your own day, you are opening yourself up. Secondly, perhaps he chose to indulge in chemicals. In his day, most likely that would have been wine. 
But they did have some other chemicals because sorcery was forbidden that involved drugs. Maybe he had experimented. I don't know this. I'm guessing. But I do know that chemicals have this power for whether it's alcohol or drugs, they have this power to alter our state. And in our altered states, when we're, we drink so much or we take drugs or something, we can find ourselves in a state where we're not making good decisions. And as a result of that, we end up inviting ourselves to attack. Everyone here is well aware of the fact that people do things under the influence they would never do in real life. And many a wise person has made a decision, you know, that's not for me because I can't control what happens once I start doing that. But I'm saying we've all seen people that once they start that, it opens themselves up. When you're not in control of your life, you may not have to feel pressure from your job or pressure from your family. It may feel good to release that struggle, but it also opens your minds up to the enemy who might be able to come against you. You know, I've uh, been reading about cybersecurity. And there's, I don't know much about it, so I probably shouldn't say anything because I'll just, those of you that know a lot about computers will just go, it's obvious he doesn't know anything, but that's pretty obvious about me already. So let me try anyway, but... I have been reading about uh, these different kinds of attacks on security and cybersecurity and, and computers. And one of the things they'll do is they, you take all this code, you know, that runs a program and the hacker gets out there and he starts figuring, how can I find a weak link in this code that I can insert a virus, a computer virus, or I can insert something that will go to work through that code to do some, make that computer do something other than what it's supposed to do or give me information that I can use against this person. But then the point is, is that you have a computer and it has this code and this hacker is trying to find a weak link and once he finds a weak link, he gets in and he infects your computer. The application is, is that you have a spiritual enemy who's constantly looking at your life trying to find a weak link in your life. He's trying to find a spot where he can worm his way in there and put a virus in your soul that's going to have you doing things and saying things and going places and being with people and being, having behavior that's going to make you hate yourself, lose your self-esteem, make you less than what you want to be. He wants to infect you. And you make choices about that. And you've got to be careful what you expose your mind to. You've got to be careful what you expose your life to. Maybe he had chosen to explore alternative spirituality. There was certainly been a lot of false gods around for him to worship, identified by the pigs. So, you and I are who we are and where we are because of the choices we've made up to this point in our life. Now, that's negative and positive. It's negative because if you don't like where you are, you've got to accept the fact that part of the reason you're where you're at is because you chose it. You chose those friends. You chose that to go to school or not. You chose those relationships. You chose that job. You chose to get up or not get up. You made choices, and there are consequences. Now, the good news is you can make new choices. You can make a different choice. And when you start making different choices, you start getting better reactions. But the point is, he had made choices. Now, that's the first thing. Think about your choices if you want to protect yourself and you're out of control. The second thing is control or choose your control agent wisely. Turn in your Bibles to Romans 6, verse 16. This is a very powerful verse. You know, a lot of people say, I really don't want anybody to tell me what to do in my life. I remember laughing one day. A guy was telling me about his son. He had a teenage son that was just really uh, chafing at his dad's control of his life. He didn't want him to limit him in any way. So he, he said he got so frustrated that when he turned 17, he was sick of, he told his dad, he said, I'm sick of you telling me what to do, so I went down and joined the Marine Corps today. And his dad just grinned. You see, the reality is he was getting a lot more control than he thought he was going to get, Right? We're going we're gonna to obey somebody. Do you know what Romans 6.16 says? Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of righteousness or obedience unto righteousness. Paul said, you are either going to obey Christ and God and live a life that leads to righteousness, or you're going to obey sin and it's going to control your life and lead to death. But you're going to be controlled by something. You're either going to be controlled by God or you're going to be controlled by sin. And the whole point is, well, I don't want anybody to control me. Not the way it works. We will be the slaves to someone. We will serve someone or something. Make your choice agent. Make a wise choice about who's going to control your life. Number three, 
Remember, and this is the good news, remember that no situation is hopeless. No situation is out of God's control. Society had given up on the demoniac. They had chained him. They had tried to medicate him. They had done everything they could. And finally they just gave up and relegated him to the tombs. But when Jesus came into his life, the impossible became possible. Wholeness, decency, an orderly life became his once he met the Master. So here's the thing. Here's the good news. Wherever you are and whatever is controlling your life, Jesus can help you. God can control you. He can change you. I've met some out of control people. I've, I've been out of control, just to be honest with you, a few times in my life. You ever been out of control? I've been out of control a few times. It's not a fun place to be. But I've met some people who are really out of control and really ruining their lives. I've met people that their family gathers around them and, and people pray with them and the pastor works with them and counselors work with them and they just keep doing things that are destructive and damaging and tearing them apart. They're out of control. I know a man who just recently has ruined his entire life through bad business decisions, chasing greed. Just the desire to have so much made him, led him to make some decisions that, that fed a desire to make more decisions until he got out of control. And now he has literally ruined his life. Destroyed his family, ruined his life. Out of control. I've known people who have controlled by drugs. I've known young men and women who have gone and done things that you can't believe what they've done. I remember a young man telling me about being so hungry for his drugs and so after his drugs that he found himself trying to get drugs in a, in a filthy bathroom from somebody and when his drugs accidentally fell into a filthy toilet, he went right after him because he had to have those drugs out of control. I mean, I've known a person who told me that's, you know, that was so out of control in the relationship area that she, well, that she did and said and uh, things that just to this day haunt her. You ever been out of control? You can get out of control. And when you get out of control, you need to understand you don't have to stay there. There is a God who can help you. Now, when I wrote that, I said that, you know, that sounds good. Jesus can help you. Jesus can help you if you're out of control. Okay, well, how does he help? How does he help? Well, let me try to give you a couple of things. One, of course, is the supernatural power. There's that, Right? He is Almighty God. He's the one who created you. He's the one who created that body that you have. He's ready. And He has the power to just step in there and change everything. But having said that, how does He actually do that? Well, one thing is He gives you a source of belief. You know, when you're out of control, one of the, one of the things that happens is, is we start accepting that we're out of control. And the more you accept that you're out of control, the worse it gets. Because if you don't think you can do something, you can't do it. It doesn't matter whether you can or not. If you don't think you can do it, you can't do it. If you don't think you can stop drinking, if you don't think you can resist the drugs, if you don't think you can stay away from the pornography, or if you don't think... You can't because you've made up your mind. You've accepted that. So what happens is when we get out of control, we need a new source of power in our life. We need something that gives us the confidence that we can change. A source of belief that will give us the confidence to actually work on the problem. And that's where Jesus comes in. Because He is Almighty God, because we have stories like this in the Bible, because we've seen His power at, the work in, at work in the lives of other people, we suddenly believe again that hope is possible and change is possible, and then we will do the hard work to make the change. Yes, He can help you. He can change you because He increases your belief and enables you to believe again. And because he has the supernatural power to cast out the demons, and because he will surround you with people who will support you and encourage you and give you strength. You know what I love about the church is that it's a family of believers, all on different levels on the journey. Some doing really good right now in their spiritual life, some just wandered in here today hanging on, and if they weren't hanging on to the pew, they wouldn't be able to stay. We have all kinds of different levels of believers. But you know what? We're all one big family and we all love each other and we all encourage one another. We all hang on to each other. I remember a guy in another church I pastored. He had a problem and, and he shared it with our group and we prayed for him and we gathered around him and loved on him and he said, I'm going to work on this. But he, this was a very serious problem. The next week he came in 
he was still a mess. And we said, how'd it go? He said, just terrible and whatever. You know what? We just put our arms around him and loved on him and held on to him and said, you know what? Next week will be better. We're going to pray. God's going to give you strength. You came to the right place. He said, well, I'm ashamed to come back. Now you bet. Don't ever be ashamed to come back. Any better. This is your family. This is where you belong. We love you. Come on back. And we just hugged on him and hang. And, he, you know, that went on for about five or six weeks. Five or six weeks, he didn't get any better. Five or six weeks, it was still bad stuff. But about seventh, eighth week, suddenly he started to make some changes and suddenly started to find some hope. Oh, I wish you could see him today. His life in control. His family is blessed. He has a ministry now where he shares with others what it's like to overcome these terrible powers of forces of control. Listen, part of what God does for us is he gives us this family of believers, this circle of influence, this place where you belong and you can go and you feel apart. You know, I almost didn't get to come today because I was... Uh, Worried about some health issues, but when I got here, I am so glad I got. And part of the thing was before I, I thought, I don't want to miss. I don't want to miss. I mean, you know, I, I have to say from time to time, and you know, everybody likes a little time away. I like a little vacation. If you want to send me to the Caribbean, I'll go. I mean, I'm willing to miss a service now and then for a vacation or uh, something like that. But, but as a general thing, I don't want to stay home. I want to be with God's people. I'm not. I'm not here. Because I have to be here. I'm here because I love being here. It's good to be here. It's good to sing the praises. It's just good, to, but it's also just good to see you, to see your faces, to see you and be a part of you. And, and some of you are doing really good and, we're, and you're helping me. And some of you are not doing so good and we're helping you. But it doesn't matter. We're all in this together. We're all God's family. And that's part of what God can do to set you free. Well, have you ever been out of control in your life? Have you ever been involved in things that you wish you wouldn't? Have you ever chased after things you said you would never do? Have you ever done things you wouldn't? Or do you know somebody like that? You can get out of that today. You can change that today because God can control the uncontrollable. Let's stand to our feet as we stand with heads bowed and eyes closed. Hi, my name's Kim Beckham. I'm the pastor of Central Baptist Church. Thanks for tuning in today and being a part of this worship service. I hope you found the message helpful and the worship inspiring. If you don't have a church home, please come check us out on a Sunday soon. If you should have any question about today's message or just want to talk about spiritual things in general, please check us out on our website and email us or call us at Central Baptist Church, 903-561-6361. So glad you are a part of the worship today. Come see us soon. God bless you.